Hello, dear friends. You're listening to the Open Heart Program with Olga Anishenko on Slavic Family Radio in Portland, Oregon. Today we have a very interesting guest. His name is Eddie Anishenko. Hello, Eddie. Hello, Ola. Thank you so much for coming to the studio today. Thank you for inviting. Eddie, I know you have a very interesting story to share with us today. Can you tell me a little bit what we will be talking about today? Ola, thank you again for inviting me. And I love the name of your program, Open Heart, because this is exactly what I am looking forward to doing. I want to open up my heart. And I want to share something so valuable, something so magnificent and miraculous that happened in my life almost 30 years ago. To put it out simply, it was a bicycle accident. To put it out fancy, we can call it a bike tragedy. Tragedy. So I would assume today we will be talking about bike tragedy and 30 years later it's ending with a bike victory i like the way you're saying it from a tragedy on a bike to many victories on a bike so eddie as i understand you live in the united states for 30 years for 30 years where did you immigrate from from the former soviet union uh, from the republic of georgia from a most precious and beautiful city on the planet called Suhumi. Suhumi. I've never been there, but guess what? My husband has been born there. <laughs> My husband is your cousin. Yes. So, Eddie, how old were you when this accident happened? I was 21, Olya. The reason I said that my heart is wide open uh, yes. to sharing this is because exactly a week ago, yes. I've celebrated my 30 years in America. I am so thankful to the Lord. I was able to go back yes. to the same very placed Russian Gospel Temple building on 17th Street in San Francisco, California. I was able to go there and physically stand by the very door of the very first building that I entered in the United States long, long 30 years ago. That's awesome. Thank you, God. And I live here for 26 years. So, Eddie, I think we are both very, very thankful to this country, America, that accepted us, the immigrants. Yes. And 30 became years. That's our home, yes. became our land, became yes. our country, became a place where we got married, we had children, we were raising children. And English became our language. And English became our language. Even though we have accent, but we share this story in English so our children, our teenagers can listen and can praise God because God is almighty. Yes, God is almighty. So, dear listeners, today you will hear a tragic story of a very, very bad bike accident. Eddie was not even promised that he will be able to walk or live in a good way, but he's miraculously walking and he's back on a long, long distance bike rides. Eddie, your time. Share your story with us. Thank you kindly, Ola, for first of all, inviting me and then for coming up with such a title uh, from bike tragedy to uh, victory on a bike um, and that is an exciting exciting title uh, so to go back and to answer your question as far as what happened I am relieving if I can use this word it's been 30 years as I am almost living it again or experiencing it again it happened 30 years ago, in fact, in about a couple of weeks or probably even less, um, uh, October uh, 1988, I am fresh off the boat, as they say, um, arrived to the United States on September 29th 
of uh, 1988. And within a week or so, uh, I am full of energy. I am full of desire to discover the United States of America. I am full of confidence that success is waiting out there for me. All I have to do is just make that step, is get outside and start exploring um, without, uh, without any fears, without any concerns about tomorrow, uh, within a week or so of arrival, I've um, uh, gotten my first job. Uh, my first job back in the day was um, working at a restaurant. Um, and, uh, and I remember um, so clearly um, um, Brazilian food restaurant. Um, here I am, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, telling everyone that, oh, I just came to America uh, and I'm from Russia, um, but I've got, um, I've got a job at a Brazilian restaurant and uh, um, was so excited and awaiting my very first paycheck. Um, I worked um, um, for just a little over a week at the time, I believe. Um, and uh, for the very first day on that particular day, the day of the so-called bike tragedy, uh, on that very first, uh, on that day, uh, for the very first time, I was allowed not to only assist with uh, preparing food um, um, for just a little bit and then for the most part, you know, clean dishes and, um, and do all that stuff. But for the first time, um, the owner of that restaurant said, well, let's try, uh, let's try cooking uh, some of the Russian um, soup. And so I've prepared borscht. Um, I was so proud of that borscht. I was just... Uh, excitingly expecting that uh, that whole pot of borscht that I've prepared is going to be gone within half an hour. And so the lunchtime came, and to the very, very discouraging surprise of mine, only one person ordered <laughs> a cup of that borscht. Um, uh, so kind of... Um, uh, <laughs> kind of unexpectedly discouraged, um, I wrapped up uh, my working day um, that afternoon. I got on my bicycle and I went home. Um, and, uh, you know, to make a story clear, that happened in San Francisco because that's where I first lived. Um, and um, uh, San Francisco is uh, very hilly. It's got some. It's got some hills, and and a restaurant was very close to the area of town that is called Russian Hill. Um, so going back home, I'd be pedaling downhill, um, and it was always, um, you know, for second week I was doing that, and it was kind of an easy ride. Coming to work was pedaling uphill. So I sort of looked forward to it after the day, which, you know, brought me a little discouragement. Um, you know, I was such a great cook. Uh, uh, with such pride, I'd be saying that I was a cook in the Soviet army. Um, and here I am prepared that awesome, flavorful, tasteful pot of borscht. And only one customer bought a cup. Um, now, obviously, looking back now, uh, I'm like, who would expect? Uh, who would expect that a customer at a Brazilian restaurant would order a cup of Russian borscht? Um, you know that uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the thought of the owner to even offer such a thing uh, just 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 says. Uh, uh, just says that he probably didn't really understand his business completely either because if I've gone to a Brazilian food, the last thing I want to try is some Russian borscht, you know, um, when the menu is full of authentic, exquisite Brazilian dishes. So anyway, uh, to the bike tragedy. Um, I do remember how I stopped at a red light. Um... Uh, 
at a given intersection. And that's the last thing that I remember to this day. Um, how I stopped uh, on that red light. Now, what took place from there is little known to me. Um, I, and the very first thing I do remember in my life is how I've opened my eyes, uh, not knowing at the time, but 10 days after the day of my bike uh, tragedy, of my bike, bike accident, um, having gone through numerous surgeries uh, and just laying down in the ho on the hospital bed, uh, not really knowing what happened, how happened, um, and then little by little, um, you know, the, the friends, the people, the doctors, uh, the nurses um, have started sharing the story of what has actually happened during those 10 days. Um, and what happened was that four blocks down the hill from the intersection where I stopped on the red light, um, I got into an accident. Um, uh, no one really knows what happened, but the story goes that I ran a, a red light um, and an oncoming vehicle um, uh, hit me um, and I flew um, off my bicycle um, for a good part of that intersection and I hit um, the left side of my head um, over the electric pole, the, the metal electric pole, the, the traffic light pole. Uh, and that caused me to lose my concussion, to lose, um, to lose everything, and obviously, you know, the the folks around, the people around the accident area, have uh, uh, called the ambulance. The ambulance came and picked me up, and they took me to San Francisco General Hospital, where they obviously started a surgery right away, and then uh, and then administrative staff that is uh, working at um, that worked at a hospital at the time started really figuring out who I am because uh, I didn't have an ID on me. I only had um, a business card from the Brazilian restaurant where I worked. So they've called the restaurant. They described me. Uh, the owner recognized uh, that that's me. That's who I am. Now, he didn't know where I live. He didn't know any of my friends or relatives. He only knew the agency that uh, brought me, an employment agency um, that he called when he needed some help. Um, so uh, he shared that number um, with uh, the administra hospital administrative staff. Uh, they've called the agency, and the agency connected um, them to uh, the Russian Gospel Temple, and that's, uh, uh, that's the church in San Francisco. Um, uh, Pastor Alexander Shevchenko was... Um, um, was the pastor of the church at that time. Um, and uh, when I say Shevchenko, that's the family of Shevchenkos that arrived uh, in the United States um, in the late 50s. So in 88, they've been in the States for already 30-some years. Um, and they were the people, they were the family, they were the church that God has used uh, to resettle a lot of people. There were no Russian or Ukrainian or Slavic um, immigrants in Sacramento back in the day. Everyone came through San Francisco um, and then eventually made their way to Sacramento because of a cheaper rent um, and cheaper life because uh, San Francisco was very expensive. So they've called uh, the church uh, and they kind of put the two and two together as far as who this, this, this guy is in front of them that's literally holding on to the life uh, by, its, uh, by, by, by the hair, as, uh, as they say. Because um, the injury was so severe, the, ac uh, the, the surgery took place for over eight hours 
hours. Uh, so they worked on the damage to my brain. Um, they sealed up um, the area they worked on. Um, and then additional, besides the brain injury, additional um, injury that I've sustained on that bike accident was um, that um, I've really damaged the bone right above my eye. Um, and the piece of it came up, um, came, came, came off, chipped off, um, and it poked my eye. Um, but uh, my my body has gone through such enormous stress uh, throughout those eight hours of open uh, brain surgery that the doctor said, if he'll survive, um, we'll be working on his eye tomorrow. Uh, and they gave very little chance for survival. Uh, and they guaranteed that if I was to survive, that I wouldn't be normal. I would really need an assistance for the rest of my life. I would be impaired, as they say. I would be disabled. I would be bound to a wheelchair. I would be dependent for someone to care for, to provide for me for the rest of my life. And that's how I opened up my eyes 10 days after to all this news of supposedly what has happened. Um, and I remember just laying there when everyone sort of left, when visitors were gone, and I was just quietly crying, Lord, I've just turned 21 less than a month ago, um, and I am expecting, I'm expected to spend the rest of my life on a wheelchair. I've expected to spend the rest of my life to have someone assisting me with just daily routine. I, I couldn't comprehend it, but I was, I was vividly reminded of that fact because I couldn't move. Uh, since the left side of my brain was severely damaged, the right side of my body became paralyzed, and so I just couldn't move. Um, I'd be laying in bed like a vegetable, um, and then I remember nurses, they would uh, sit me up um, on the bed, and they would tie a rope over my chest, tying me up um, to the to uh, to the top of the bed, so I would spend some time uh, sitting versus just laying like vegetables, uh, as I've already said. Um, and then um, as days went on, they'll be sitting, trying to sit me on a chair and tie me to a chair. And I remember one time um, I was trying to move from that chair before they even could tie me up um, and they couldn't hold me uh, uh, and and I fell on the floor and so um, those things uh, were such uh, um, were such an evidence constant evidence in my mind that wow the rest of my life could be this and I can't really explain what has gone um, as far as as far as me trying trying to really adjust to the to the new reality of my day. Um, came to United States at the age of 21. Went to San Francisco because that's the that's the city I've seen um, in some movie, and uh, and and so I've had all this all these hopes, I had all these dreams, I had all these desires uh, to achieve and become something, and in less than a month from arriving to the United States, having gone through this bike tragedy, as I am supposedly bound. Uh, to be disabled uh, for the rest of my life. Such was the predicament. Uh, this was something that the doctors said. 
but surprisingly, surprisingly, uh, to doctors and to everyone else around, and to a huge surprise of myself, God had a totally different future for me. And little by little, my conditions started improving. Uh, to go back uh, to the piece of bone that broke off right above my eye and was poking my eye, uh, miraculously, the day after the surgery, when doctors you know, came back to check on me, on how I was doing, um, uh, they saw no piece of bone sticking into my eye. My eye was completely, completely healed. I did not need that second surgery. But as time went on, um, as I've started gaining consciousness, conscience, um, and uh, as this, as this day in and out routine of being tied to a chair for about half an hour kept on going um, after about after about a month um, I started making progress churches um, you know the Russian Gospel Temple in San Francisco churches in Oregon because uh, my family lived in Oregon at the time um, and so uh, uh, particularly church in Woodburn, um, Oregon, they were praying. Uh, there was a Slavic church in Los Angeles that's been praying as well. So Christians were praying um, and lifting up my name in front of the Lord. An answer came. Uh, little by little, I started gaining confidence in how I sit up. I couldn't walk, uh, but about a month um, after um, after I gained conscience, I was able to sit up without being tied by a rope. I'd be I'd be sitting by myself, and then it took about another month, and they've started teaching me walking all over again. And to make this a very long. Um, story short, about uh, seven months, six to seven months after the injury happened, um, I was released uh, to go home. Um, a very extensive post-hospital uh, visits to therapists, um, but I was released to go home. I couldn't walk by myself um, for um, uh, for extensively long time, I could al I, I always had to be supported by someone. But little by little, my uh, health returned, and um, and the right side of my body, uh, which severely uh, was was paralyzed, um, uh, came back. I've I've got the feeling. I've started walking. I've started enjoying. Uh, little by little, um, every day life um, that we take for granted. Um, so that's the story of what uh, took place. And I don't really want to emphasize um, on the great details that I still remember 30 years after. I remember a conversation, and I do want to share it, um, once I was moved from the hospital where um, where the first surgery took place. I was there for, for a little over a month, and they, they moved me to a different hospital, Laguna Hospital in San Francisco. This is where uh, the therapy started really taking place. And I remember um, the person who was managing that uh, therapy uh, um, uh, department, if I can say, um, she was... Um, um, also 
um, from uh, the former Soviet Union. I don't remember the part of the Soviet Union she was from, um, but she spoke Russian. Um, and, um, you know, once a day she'd come by. She was not the doctor that treated me. She was not the therapist that was exercising with me on a regular basis and stuff. But once a day, knowing that I was uh, from the former Soviet Union, she'd stop by and um, we'd just have a little conversation. And I do uh, remember uh, one conversation specifically. Uh, she was going over um, you know, my progress, um, and as far as what awaits me, that, yeah, in approximately a couple of months, they'll discharge me or they'll release me from the hospital, um, uh, and I would probably get um, a disability pension. Um, that was her anticipation, and uh, she goes, because you wouldn't really be able to work. She said, you, wouldn't, you, you aren't able to drive, you aren't able to operate machinery. Um, you could probably do some light office work, but your English, uh, she says, isn't good. Um, so uh, most likely you'll get your disability pension. And, uh, and I sit there with my, with my thoughts going, well, well, a disability pension, how will I live? Uh, uh, and again, I bring up that one precise conversation to show uh, once again the gravity um, of the tragedy that did strike and the miraculous, miraculous, and let me repeat it one more time, um, miraculous hand of God um, that restored me, that brought my health back, that brought um, that that brought everything that He had given me from my birth, that He had granted me back, and I was able about a year after, about a six months um, after the accident, I was released and I've gone home. Um, I was um, going back to therapeuticals, um, uh, to therapy um, every day for the first month or so, and then every other day for another couple of months, and then one twice a week, and then once a week, and then eventually, about a year after a surgery, um, I was completely off um, the therapy procedures, and little by little, I started walking by myself. Um, I started writing because uh, I couldn't hold a pen or a pencil in my hand. Um, I started doing uh, the things um, that, like I've said already once, we all take for granted. Eddie, after this accident, did you ever blame God for letting this happen to you? Did you get upset? Did you feel like it wasn't fair? Were you angry at him? Did you feel like he didn't protect you? Or were you blaming yourself? Um, by about a year and a half or so from the time I was healed and I, um, I, 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 I regained my life, if I can say that. I've gone back to work, um, not to that uh, Brazilian restaurant. I've uh, I got a job at Safeway, and I worked at the delicatessen section. Uh, this is where my English kind of, I've, I've picked it up there, because um, I remember, you know, the different, different, different kinds of um, you know, there is a mortadella sausage, there is salami, there is there is Swiss cheese, there is that kind of cheese, there is this kind of cheese, there is different salads. And so, um, you know, little by little, I've started improving with my English. But um, about a year and a half um, post my recovery, um, on a given weekend, um, and, um, and I remember precisely that it was Saturday because the following day was Sunday, was church service, um, and I was laying on my bed and a thought came to me, Lord, why? Why did I have to go through what I went through? Um, I, I mean, such a, such a significant, significant uh, and severe um, accident 
um, your miraculous restoration of my life. But but why? Um, what was the purpose? Um, and it almost nagged me to the point where I was becoming um, almost a little bit upset. Um, I, I was like, I, I didn't see a reason for why I've gone through this. And I was kind of laying on my bed and I was searching for an answer as to why when all of a sudden this simple thought strikes my mind and my whole body shakes. Eddie, why are you asking why? Doesn't the fact that you were bound, you were convicted almost, if I can use that word, the doctors convicted, the doctors prescribed you a life in a wheelchair, a life of some sort of assisted living, and you are walking, and you are running, and you are going to work every day. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't that simple fact of God's grace and mercy and a miraculous restoration isn't a fact that is all worth to go what you have gone through? I mean, what does your why have anything to do with this miracle that you had experienced in your life? And when that thought struck me, I was blown away by the stupidity of my question. I was like, why do I care why? Even if I was chosen to be the experience of God's miraculous miracle of restoration, that's that's like winning a lottery. That's like becoming... Uh, there's... There's no number that I can come up with uh, that, that, that one can pay to regain what I've regained. If God chose me just to be just to be an instrument, just to be that one out of gazillion of human beings, who would be the one on whom this miraculous restoration of God's grace is performed? That is why and I shouldn't be asking the question I should be rejoicing I should be going out there in joy and I should be testifying and I should be sharing this story of what God did in my life and ever since I've never had that question asked of me was it easy um, no it wasn't and no it wasn't we are human beings and something that so severely at some point affected us tends to leave us um, again um, with 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 this nagging question as to why and if we let it dwell for too long in our mind it will um, become something that lives inside us um, it will become something that will almost control and possess us to the point um, where we'll become so upset um, first at the circumstances around us then at people around us and then eventually at God and that is what Satan wants uh, to happen out of smallest misfortune out of the smallest defeat out of the smallest tragedy of your or my life and uh, equipped with everything that God has shown to us we should stand victorious we should we should proclaim his victory we should proclaim his grace we should proclaim his miracles in our lives Eddie I assume after such an accident, you'd probably be very scared to get on a bike again and ride again. Did you ever have that fear? And if you did, how did you overcome that fear? It took me years to get back on riding a bicycle. 
Um, I've already had children. Um, I started teaching them how to ride bicycles. And so um, I kind of made my way back uh, to riding a bicycle. And uh, my original rides were in a very safe places, places where there would be no chance of running into a car or, um, or running into any um, unforeseen uh, danger, if I may use this word. Um, but with time, I found I found that the fact that I am riding a bicycle gives me a sense of completeness. Um, you know, in my memory, uh, knowing exactly what I've gone through, um, and at, for many, many years being afraid to even touch a bicycle, to get on a bike and then to start riding it gave me a sense of accomplishment and achievement. And little by little, I've gone and started making my ride, uh, my bicycle rides on, on city streets, um, along, alongside the vehicles, alongside where people walk. Um, and they weren't long, they weren't extensive, but I started, uh, I started riding. Um, you know, I'd, I'd get from, um, from if, if you live in Portland, you know, I'll get from Clackamas to Southeast Portland and I'll cheer myself. Wow, I've been on a bicycle for 15 minutes, uh, I'm riding on the streets and, uh, and I'm still riding and nothing happened. Um, and then um, a family came into my life um, and they were bicyclists. And um, a husband said that he bicycles every year from Portland uh, to Oregon coast on this um, ride that is called Reach the Beach. And I got very excited. It was a huge challenge for me. Um, by the time I already rode around Portland pretty confidently, I could be on a bicycle for hours on at a time, and then I'll get off, get some rest, and then I'll pop on back on the bike. Um, but to ride to the coast, a um, 105 mile ride was something that I, I, I could not see myself complete. Um, but excitingly I've told um, I, I've, I've told my friend that yeah, keep me posted the next ride I'm definitely wanting to ride. Um, and he did in a few months he said, well here is the here's how you register um, and I went and registered. And this is where I almost started panicking. I started getting ready, um, and I realized how I'm, I, I mean, I'd, I'd ride, um, you know, 40, 40 mile ride, but it will take me several hours and bunch of stops and rests. And so I got really um, concerned, will I be able to make uh, that ride to the beach? Uh, but the day came and we did make that ride. Um, and as of this year, I've probably done that ride for about, uh, yeah, definitely four years. Um, and this last year, the summer of 2018, not only did I my reach the beach bicycle ride, but for the first time, I've challenged myself and I've succeeded in riding Seattle to Portland. Um, anyone who is listening, they can Google S. TP. That's a yearly Seattle to Portland ride, which is typically completed in two days, but I've completed it in one day. It was a challenge that I told myself that I will try to do it in one day. And the completion of this ride, of a 204-mile ride, is going to be my glorious, glorious shout to the Lord. God, 30 years ago, I was predicted to spend the rest of my life on a wheelchair. I was told that I will not be normal. I was told that I will need assist, uh, assistance with basic tasks of my life, such as dressing up, such as drinking a cup of tea, such as taking a bite of some, uh, of some dessert. And God gave me the ability to ride from Seattle to Portland, 204 mile ride in one day. 
isn't that fact by itself just ju- just a glorious glorious witness to what God can do in a person's life um, another um, another example of just overcoming fear and feeling victorious and again when I say when I say feeling victorious I'm not saying feeling victorious for myself for my achievements no feeling victorious for the Lord feeling victorious for the God saying Lord you've restored me and 30 years later I remembered and I want to do something in this in this body of mine being restored I want to do something for the glory of you and that was uh, going back to San Francisco and riding the same streets where that bike tragedy took place long 30 years ago because uh, for years I could never imagine myself getting on a bicycle in San Francisco and last year on my 50th birthday or day after my 50th birthday um, I've done it um, my dear wife Oksanechka and I we went to San Francisco we took our bicycles with us and we cycled around San Francisco for almost an entire day um, I started very slow, right from the right from the location of Russian Gospel Temple. This is where I lived 30 years ago. This is the place from where I went on a bicycle the day when the tragedy took place. So on my 50th birthday, 29 years ago, I started slowly in the same direction, driving my bicycle. And on that sunny morning, I remember I was saying, Lord, I'm doing this for the glory of you you've restored me you gave me a beautiful life I had such a beautiful 30 years since that bike accident I am doing this right for the glory of you I want this right to be the glorious loudest shout to be the glorious loudest worship song in heaven and I'm glad I did that I overcame that fear And I'm looking forward to many more beautiful bicycle rides around the glorious city of San Francisco. Eddie, I know this bike accident affected your health in some way, and the doctors were promising that you will probably not be able to walk or be in a wheelchair or you will never be able to ride a bike, but you are riding bikes. You are riding long distance, and I heard you guys do lots of hikings almost weekly can you please tell us about your hiking life because you guys go up high on a very long distance that even a regular person cannot do it but you do it yes Ola, uh, we do and i've mentioned it earlier that i wanted my bike ride to be the glorious shout i want my entire life to be a glorious shout of glory to our Lord. Apostle Paul says in one place, he goes, therefore present your bodies. You know, we don't worship the Lord only on Sunday or on Saturday. We don't worship the Lord only in church. We don't worship the Lord only when we're on our knees praying or standing up and singing. Our entire life, everything we do 24 7 when we're asleep we worship the Lord when we are awake we worship the Lord when we're at work we worship the Lord so I look at my life and I look at some of the challenges that I'm throwing myself as a way of glorifying God. Yes, I have gone through an experience where I was told I would be on a wheelchair for the rest of my life, but that didn't happen. God healed me. And so I want to do more than just get by. I want to do more than walk the least I can. I want to walk the very most I can. I want to challenge myself. And so therefore, we do hike. I've been blessed uh, with Oksanechka. She is such a helper. She is such a trooper. She is such a pioneer. Together, we're encouraging one another. She encourages me more. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, we, uh, we hike. Um, and we hike some challenging trails 
for a couple of reasons. For once, uh, it's a challenge and I am going, God, I'm pouring some sweat out. Some Anishenko is pouring out of me, you know, <laughs> and that's once. And then number two, I am observing such beautiful, glorious creation of the Lord. The places we go I typically do not have a lot of traffic. There aren't that many people. And so those are my temples where I bow in my spirit, in my heart, and I'm, and I'm screaming, Lord, you've created this. This is your sanctuary. You gave me another day, another day, another opportunity to worship you in place where maybe birds and some few animals or, or some creatures are screaming out in and, 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 and the worship, but here I am, a human being. Uh, you know, we've just gone through this wonderful experience of visiting Peru and going through a four-day mountain hike. Uh, you know, we started on one side of Andes, mm -hmm. and we went up over 15,000, a little over 15,000 feet elevation, and then down through the Amazon forest. Mm -hmm. uh, undescribable, undescribable beauty of Lord's creation. And God gave me an opportunity to structure our trip in such a way that the day of my 51st birthday, mm -hmm. we've reached the Machu Picchu. This is wow. one of the seventh wonders of the world. Wow. And reading about it and learning about it on the internet, I figured out that, uh, yeah, supposedly it's an ancient city that was built by Incas and it's visited by 3,000 and a half people daily. But they're all fascinated by this Incas creations and this and that. So something told me in my heart, God, I doubt that very many of those 3,500 people daily are actually there to say, thank you, Lord. Yes, yes. And I want to be there on the day of my 51st birthday. <laughs> and in the very morning when the sun will rise, I want to kneel on that place. And I want to say, God, I thank you for the 51 year that you let me walk this planet Earth. And I'm thanking you in this place where so few are worshiping you. I want my four-day sacrifice of going through extreme weather conditions, of going over those passes, of headaches, of cold, severe nights. I want it all to be a sacrifice for this one moment, this one sunrise on the day of my birthday of screaming out, Lord, I worship you. My body worships you. I thank you, God. You are victorious, and in you, victories are evident in our daily lives. Wow, Eddie, you're one of a kind. Uh, Happy birthday, by the way. I know it has been, what, like a few weeks ago? It's a month been a few weeks, <laughs> but thank so, you. Eddie, listening to you, I can tell you, I would assume you're not going to the gym. You don't need a gym in your life. Yeah, we we go sauna, but we don't we don't you go don't gym. You don't go workout because yeah. uh, hiking and biking it's a huge workout. I agree with you. You go places, you see those birds, you see those trees. You you praise God. That's the best thing you can do. Yes. You praise God. You know what my dream is? Uh huh. I really want to travel around the world. I want to see the nature, I want to see people, I want to hear different languages, and I want to praise God in every part of the world. What an awesome, awesome desire. May God fulfill it in your life. <laughs> but I'm very proud of you, Eddie, that wherever you go, you. you praise God. That's number one. That's the whole goal of your life. That's the whole purpose, and you have a lot to thank God for, because... Yeah. Unfortunately, so often when people have not been in any accidents, when they have been healthy very all their life, they forget to stop and say, thank you, God, I'm walking. Thank you, God, I'm talking. Thank you, God, I can hear. Yes. yes. Thank you for sharing such a good story, Eddie. So you have been through a lot in life, and, and I'm, I'm very inspired by you, by this story, and having gone through this experience, I want to ask, 
What lessons have you learned? What can be a support to someone who is going through some hard time, through some kind of tragedy in their life? How can you support them? What can you tell them, Eddie? Olya, what a good question. And I can't really give an advice. I can only say that humbling ourselves, regardless what life has brought us, is a foundation upon which God will bring a miracle in our life. Amen. If I'm not humbled, there is nothing for God to start working on. Mm-hmm. Because anything he'll do for me will still end up being questioned, will still end up in some sort of doubt in my mind, will still end up in some sort of comparison to what God has done in the lives of others. So humbling ourselves, humbling myself and saying, Lord, even if I don't have a heart full of gratitude, even if I don't have a heart full of praise, let me pause. Let me just be quiet going through what is so unexplainable to me. Let me not ask too many questions. Let me guard my heart from something that might further hurt me, from something that may be a stumbling block to your recovery, to what you have prepared for me. So, pausing, just pausing. You don't have to just boom, be filled with spirit. Uh, We all got this certain expectations. Oh, run to your room, lock yourself in your closet, don't get off your knees, just keep praying, just keep asking, God will deliver. And, and, and yeah, in reality, we need to be, but that doesn't mean necessarily that I'm 24-7 on my knees. Yes. I am humbled. I'm on my knees in my spirit. 24-7. I am accepting. I am accepting. I do have many questions, but I'm accepting what happened. And that is the foundation, as I've said, upon which... The answers will come. God will reveal them in due time. In due time. It may not happen the next day. It may not happen tomorrow. Um, You know, at the circumstances of my life, as I was saying, it took me over a year until I was able to go by myself and leave a house outside and, and and just do my several blocks of of travel, of walking by myself. I know people that, you know, haven't been so lucky. Um, And for some reason, the miraculous God I am talking about hasn't performed a miracle in their life yet. Amen. But that is not a reason to start questioning him. That is not a reason to start questioning his authority. Ah, For some reason... He leads a person who goes through a certain challenge that way. Now, we end up in challenges ourselves as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I was wearing a helmet on that tragedy day that I've described in details, maybe the tragedy would have been a little bit less. I don't know. There are circumstances in our life that we caused them to happen simply because we were not careful enough, we were not wise enough, we were not enough, let's say that word, (laughs) something (laughs) enough, and as a result, we have suffered. Life is a good teacher. Yes, it is. Life is an excellent teacher, and we have to be thankful for the lessons we get. Yes. Eddie, do you believe that everything happens for a reason? I do. And uh, um, everything comes from God. Everything is allowed in our life to happen, obviously not without God, because God is everything, God is everywhere, and if God had a purpose for something not to happen, he would. But then also our miraculous God, in his miraculous wisdom, gave something to us, to his creation, and that something is called a choice. Mm -hmm. And so, 
I have a right in my life to choose. We underestimate, we never pay enough attention to that powerful ability of ours that we have. God will not force himself. So there are a lot of things. I'm going back to what I've mentioned once. You know, there are some consequences in my life that I've encountered as a result of some choices that I've made at some point. And so life is a good lesson because it always has consequences. So to answer a question, if everything is allowed by God, it's allowed in the way that he did not miraculously prevent yes. something from happening because it was a consequence of my choice. Can I ask you this question? It's a tricky question and then we are going to finish. Do you wish this bike accident never happened? Or today you could say, I'm glad it happened because I learned a lot. If you would have asked me that question a year after it happened, yes, um, I probably would have said, yes, I wish it never happened. But 30 years after, I am saying I'm so glad it happened. It taught me a lot. And the most valuable lesson I took from it all was described in my answer to your question of what would I suggest, what advice would I mm -hmm. give? It taught me to become humble. It taught me humility. It was so severe that it didn't leave any wiggle room. Oh, if I only strive a little bit harder, I'll make it. No, mm -hmm. I wasn't going to make it. I made it only by God's miracle. Glory. yeah. By God's mercy. By God's mercy. And so it humbles you. When you're in front of something that's totally outside of your control, that really humbles you. So I, I think sometimes God sends us those situations and he makes you powerless and then he shows his miracle. He does. And then it shows how powerful he is. Yes. Eddie, thank you so much for sharing your miraculous story today with us and I hope this story will encourage others to humble themselves when they're going through hard time to never give up to fight for themselves Amen. for their health and Amen. to try new things in life exactly. life is beautiful life, life is exciting is beautiful. I can't wait when I get on a bike it's in my plans Eddie <laughs> and I really want to go hike that mountain too yes thank you so much for sharing your story may God bless you you. May you live 70 more years until you're 120 and ride your bike. Be a good example to us. Thank you, Ola. Thank, Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you, listeners, for being with us. Bye-bye.